Hello, my name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant. Today I'm going to be covering this book, A Chorus of Buffalo. The subtitle is A Personal Portrait of an American Icon. Right off the bat, I'm going to say it's a short book. The actual meat of the text only covers 177 pages. So it's not long, and there's a lot of short chapters that are only a couple paragraphs long. Additionally, to add to some of the books on my shelves that either refer to another nature author or are referred to the reader by another nature writer, the back cover of this book includes praise by Doug Peacock, author of Grizzly Years, one of Edward Abbey's friends widely considered to be the inspiration for one of the characters within the Monkey Wrench Gang. Doug Peacock is mentioned by name in the book The Lost Grizzlies by Rick Bass, as well as in one of Terry Tempest Williams' books, which I don't think I've covered here. So yeah, the praise by Doug Peacock reads, The appearance of A Chorus of Buffalo may be the most important wildlife publication event of the year. Rudner gives us an intimate portrait of America's quintessential animal. This book is one I first picked up in 2018. I'm fairly certain I picked it up at Rest in Used Books, I believe is the name of it. I've mentioned it before. This is the bookmark for Reston's Used Bookshop. It is at Lake Ann, 1623 Washington Plaza, Reston, Virginia, 20190. It is open every day. It's a good, cute bookstore. I've been there many a time. It's where I got The Desert Smells Like Rain and a lot of other books on my shelf. This book was first published in 2000. This copy, I believe, was printed in 2004. The copy I have is used. I, yeah, if you look on the outside, you can see I've got some water damage there. Part of the binding isn't as great as it could be near the middle of the book. At the bottom of the book, it is starting to come undone, but I don't let that detract from the merits of this book. This book is about looking at a bigger picture scope of what the American bison means to the American people, especially in the West. Where the book American Buffalo in Search of a Lost Icon by Stephen Rinella is about a man's passion for bison and putting a lot of it in context, that one focuses more on the ranching of bison, the hunting of them, because it culminates in that very personal moment in the author's life, the hunting of a bison, and extracting its meat from the wilderness. Thank you, book. What this book is, is instead looking at the bison in Montana, Idaho, Wyoming, in a bigger picture, in a broader sense than just hunting and ranching. There is a line in the first chapter, The Politics of Buffalo, that I think really captures the core argument of this book and why it means so much to me. In this scenario, the buffalo is another spotted owl, a gray wolf, a black tail prairie dog, an animal interfering with a perceived God-given right to override the Earth's need if it interferes with how we do business. In a healthy ecosystem, all the components, animals, plants, people, soil, air, fire, and water are extant. In a failing ecosystem, one in which humans set themselves up as knowing more than the Earth, more than God, more than the whole history of life on this planet, Animals, plants, rivers, and mountains become expendable. They are seen as subservient, there to do the bidding of humans. Each of these animals, owl, wolf, prairie dog, buffalo, provides a talisman to brandish for the Westerner concerned with states' rights. As we have become sophisticated in utilizing fear in our political tactics, these animals have become powerful symbols arousing huge passions. One of the great obstacles 
in the controversy is leaving jurisdiction of wild bison in Montana to the Department of Livestock rather than transferring it back to the Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, where it resided until 1995, the agency responsible for wildlife. For wildlife to be dealt with by the agency charged with overseeing domestic livestock is a travesty, a kind of final triumph of the 19th century U.S. government campaign to rid the West of buffalo. Killing buffalo that first time around was also a political act, one designed to starve Indians into submission, to get them off the land and onto reservations. With them out of the way, the government could offer Indian land to settlers and cattle. In the eyes of the settler, the rancher, Buffalo once again pose a threat to his family and to his herds. Only this time, the government has replaced the Indians as adversary in the fight over territory. This would actually be quite funny if it were not so tragic to see so many people fighting over a land they all love. And if the buffalo were not the pawn in a game that has nothing to do with him. This book, as I stated earlier, covers a wider scope, a wider range of topics than American Buffalo. It covers the local Native American tribal claim, cultural claim to Buffalo. It covers the rancher's claim to hatred of the Buffalo. It even covers the Buffalo in the sense of entertainment. It covers the Buffalo in the sense of the National Park Service mission. It covers the buffalo in all these different facets of life in the northwestern U.S., the northern Rockies. So as an example of how it covers the Native American aspect of this debate, the first Sundance at Rocky Boys was held in 1918. The ceremony had to be modified because there were no buffalo skulls anywhere. Not only did buffalo no longer roam the plains, but their bones, their skulls, were also gone, gathered by destitute farmers to sell to glue factories for income enough to hang on a little longer, or to move on. Everything was taken away from the plains after the slaughters, Don said. We couldn't find no buffalo skull. We ended up using a steer skull which might not seem significant to a non-Indian, he added. In a way, it would be like offering communion with grape juice instead of wine in a Catholic church, or blowing a trumpet instead of a ram's horn on Rosh Hashanah in a Jewish synagogue. In another way, there is no comparison, because neither the Catholic nor the Jew sees the vine or the ram as a relative. For the Indian, the buffalo is kin. In the chapter labeled Chief, there is a discussion about a bison named Chief that is an entertainer. It is a animal tamed by one family that has used bison in rodeo shows for generations. Ruth Rudner describes the scene at this rodeo thusly. A metal ramp was lowered from the top of the trailer about 12 feet up to the ground. Chief ran up the ramp to the top of the trailer where on command he lay down. In the course of training, Jerry Wayne feeds his buffalo on top of the trailer so they will find the climb, and the narrow trailer top rewarding. Jerry Wayne climbed to the top of the trailer, gave Chief another affectionate pat, then moved a pedestal into position. Chief, now standing, placed his front feet on the pedestal, then raised one foot. In salute to Montana, the announcer said. For a moment, nothing moved. There was no sound. There was only the buffalo standing on top of a trailer with his foot raised in salute. For a moment, both announcer and audience let the silence and the buffalo be. Then the announcer said, You need cooperation from a buffalo because you can't force a buffalo to do anything. Jerry Wayne sat down on the pedestal. Behind him, Chief placed a front leg over his shoulder. In 1989, at the Livingston Roundup Rodeo, I saw Jerry Wayne's father and his buffalo do this too. I wondered the same thing now as I had wondered then. How does the buffalo know how much the man can bear? How does the man know the buffalo will follow the rules? The stance is almost possessive on the part of the buffalo. Proprietary. This is my person. 
I have trained him. Jerry Wayne Olson is a third generation buffalo trainer. The first family buffalo was trained by his grandfather because somebody bet him he couldn't do it. Old timers occasionally come up to Jerry Wayne after a show to say, I saw your granddad and his buffalo. So on one hand, there's the desecration of tribal rituals and rites by the lack of bison. On the other hand, there's the threat of bison and how they mingle with cattle and the threat of a disease, brucellosis. There is the interaction between bison and the entertainer. Ultimately, I think Ruth Rudner leans more on the absence of the bison in this story, how the bison being missing from these Plains Indians ceremonies hurts them so much more than the bison hurt ranchers in their own lives. So I think there is a bias to this book, but it is still very informative and educational and passionate about bison and their place in the Northern Rockies. I think this bias shows most heavily in the chapter on page 93 titled Buffalo Skull. As part of our tour of the Rocky Boys Reservation, Don Myers took me to see a sweat lodge. Outside the lodge, as is traditional, there is a large fire pit to heat the stones used for the sweat. Directly across from the fire pit is the door to a modest house. We entered the house. The sweat lodge, built of bent willows in the traditional way, then covered with blankets and quilts, is set up in the living room space. Isn't that odd? I asked Don. It's an accommodation, he said. Like using the steer's head until they got a buffalo skull in the Sundance, I thought. These people are used to making accommodations. A length of carpet extends the few feet from the lodge entrance to an altar set up opposite the entrance. There is supposed to be a buffalo skull on the altar, Don said. The altar is bare. Here, too, Don has shown me the buffalo's absence. This book emphasizes the buffalo's absence in all parts of the West, save for certain national parks, ranches, and state parks. How the bison, due to the influence of ranchers, are sequestered onto national parks that have become little more than bison zoos, where visitors hope and expect to see bison, rather than seeing those bison roaming on the plains as those people drive to the national parks. Ranchers rule the West still. And this book comes down against ranchers for the most part. I liked this book. I read it in, I think it was 2018. I read it again. I've read it multiple times, three or four times since owning it, first reading that. And I think it's a really good book. It's short, it's sweet, it's to the point. I only bought it for seven and a half dollars, but I think it really earned that value in the time I've had it. I think if you want to learn about Buffalo in a modern cultural sense, this is the book for you. It doesn't cover the history in the 1800s, the early 1900s like other books will. This one covers a very recent and contemporary perspective on bison. Even though this book is 20 years old and the subject matter perhaps 25, 30 years old, I think it is still very relevant to today's treatment of bison. I think if you want to learn more about bison, you should pick up this book. I enjoyed it and I hope you will too. My name is Wildstag, and thank you for tuning in to another used book rant.